And there we go. You all can hear me okay, right? We thumbs up. We're doing good. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Val, for being such a badass and putting this thing together, keeping it together, making these adjustments. Uh, there are people like you who want to impact, inspire, and, and touch the world, and, and they do it regardless. Perseverance is a quality that we don't talk about enough, and we should talk about it some more. But when we recognize it in people, we should shout it out. So, Val, thank you for having me on. Thank you. We're, I'm, I'm talking today about motivation, about being being what you wish to see, right? The, the, the famous Gandhi reflection about you must be the change you wish to see. There's actually a lot of behavioral science behind that. And there's a lot of physics behind that. We tend to forget in our woo-woo culture that there's a lot of positive thinking that, that that's helpful and it's undoubtedly helpful. Uh, there's a lot of motivation, inspiration that's helpful, undoubtedly helpful. There's a lot of, a lot of well-wishing that is helpful psychologically for mental health, sure. But also the reality of this world and a component that's, that's often left out is what Einstein said, nothing happens until something moves. And we have to recognize that it's in the marriage of those two things, the marriage of wanting something and then the behavior of doing it, that things get done. And in, especially in this, this past, uh, I don't know where all of you are, I'm smack them, looking at the New York City skyline on the other side of me. And we uh, sometimes feel like I'm in a different country than some of my buddies in Florida and Texas and Arizona. But, but if, if I've learned anything uh, in this in this time is, is that we have to make these adjustments. We have to make adjustments. We have to allow for the flow. And this is, this is in a lot of ways been a, like a, a popping moment. So I'm not, not sure too, too, too sure how much any of you know about me. I'm a writer uh, specializing in behavioral science. Uh, I've become to known as an inspirational writer simply because I tend to uh, like Hemingway, I tend to bleed on paper and, and it tends to inspire and motivate. I'm just being honest and therapeutic on paper and it tends to inspire others. I've spent the last 20 years with the incredible blessing of being invited to travel around the world to think out loud. It's a, it's a fantastic job if you can get it. Uh, and I get to pick and choose great events like this one, work with people like Val who really want to, just for those of you who, who know Val or don't know Val behind the scenes, it's the same person. One of the few times in two decades that I've had somebody behind the scenes never say anything they don't say in front of everybody else. Val genuinely wants to help others create a community and organization that, in which everybody rises. I can't tell you in my career how rare that is. So thanks again for that, Val. And, and recognizing that we have to make these adjustments, recognizing that this is a moment for us to adjust. When I, before I became in here, I, I, before any of the degrees, before any of the things that I did, I was a military veteran. Actually, before that, I was in high school and I barely graduated high school. I actually literally, and I, and I have it framed in our office, I literally one year failed lunch. Like I failed lunch because it was a, it was a module period back then. It wasn't periods, it was modules. And, and I didn't go, <laughs> I didn't go. And so I actually have a report card in which I failed lunch. And so I was going through, through school and, and I grew up, I'm, I'm in, from the North shore of Long Island. And, and our community is one in which you have the really wealthy the really wealthy old money, they call it, right? The really wealthy old money and the, moder the, the immigrants, my, my parents, I'm a first generation, the immigrants that service the, the old money. And I was, my dad, I was really fortunate where my dad, um, he, was, he was in construction. He pretty much did anything he could. Um, and one day he was asked to, one of his wealthy clients had passed away unfortunately and his his estate had asked him to come clean up and get it ready for an, an estate sale and he saw a big pile of books from this gentleman's library and the family said i oh, just throw those out those are worthless my dad coming from an abject poverty that i'll never understand it hurt his soul to throw away those books so he brought them home to our attic apartment 
And I started reading these books. I was 10, 11 years old. I didn't know it at the time, but I'm reading these books that are, you know, not just think and grow rich, but meditations by Marcus Aurelius. You got a guy who took over the known world and then blogged about it, you know, did, did a diary about it. And so I'm reading these incredible pieces of work and writing Plutarch's lives. I'm reading things that are change and shape the world, but I'm going to school and they want me to read of mice and men. I don't care who tended the rabbits. I'm just reading the diary of a man who took over the known world. And, and I'm, I'm taking this information in and of all these things I'm reading, I always think, and you kind of hear it with the woo-woo society we have now, you kind of hear it in the, you're going to get this enlightenment, this sense of feeling, this, oh, it's kind of just going to hit you and you just understand it now and life is no problem. Life's no problem. You ever notice that the extra spiritual people whisper to you, life's no problem. You've got this. And I always thought it was going to come that way, but it, it didn't. It didn't come that way. And then as I navigating through high school uh, while I was at home reading Marcus Aurelius, while I was ho at home reading those works, I was going to high school and there comes a certain time where girls become so much prettier than Marcus Aurelius and you get distracted. And so I wasn't going to class. I was failing everything. Uh, I barely graduated high school and I went into, I was such a genius, such a genius that I signed up for the military military police, um, I'm a proudly a decorated veteran. And the genius I was, Air Force basic training is in San Antonio, Texas. This genius signs up for July. So it's 125 degrees and you're dressed up like a tree and they, they march you on blacktop because they're super compassionate like that. And so I'm going through the motions, it's hot, every day is hot. And I don't know any of you have been through basic training or know anyone who has, it's very monotonous. Every day is literally the same thing. It is literally same crap, different day. And you're going through the motions and you're going through it. And I remember, I'll never forget my moment. We're going through the motions, we're kind of like in a fog and it's just same crap, different day. It's hot, you're tired, you're hungry, you're going through a fog. and. And we just weren't getting it right. It was a flight of 60 of us, 60 soldiers. We weren't getting it right. And the drill instructor is losing his mind. You've seen those types that they're wearing the Smokey the Bear hat, just yelling every chance they can get. And he's pacing back and forth. And he says, what's wrong with y'all? Get in formation. So we, we get, it's never good. It's never good when he says that. We get in formation. There we are, 60 of us locked up, standing up straight. And, and a blacktop in San Antonio, Texas, as this guy paces back and forth saying, what's wrong with y'all? I know, say pop, pop, say pop again, pop, pop. He said, do you know what that is? That's the sound of your head coming out of your ass. And I'll tell you what, that was my whole moment. That was it. It was that moment of realization that you say, wait a minute. I can adjust anything I want. Same crap, different day is a lie. It is, it is zombie speak. People ask me for so long, hey, do you watch The Walking Dead? Yeah, all day, every day. All day, every day. I've never seen the show you're talking about. But zombies, all day, every day. And they speak to each other. They have a language. They say, it is what it is. Same crap, different day right? Easier said than done. Zombie speak. It's how you keep yourself imprisoned in a psychological prison, but it's actually worse than prison because in prison, at least you can see the bars. And so I have this say pop moment where I realized same crap, different day is a lie. I can change something. I can behave in a manner in which sets me up for a better tomorrow, for, for a better later. And I did. I changed a guy who had failed lunch literally two months before in high school. I finished basic training as an expert marksman in three weapons, three different rifles. I'm from the North Shore of Long Island. I promise you that's the first time I ever even held one. Ended up an expert marksman in three. And as I cruised along, finishing 
basic training as an honor graduate, finishing then police academy and learning incredible things, finishing as an honor graduate and getting promoted because of how well I did in police academy. I got to go into a couple of other programs that are pretty awesome. And I, and I finally got the chance to say, but I can't tell you about them, but they were rigging awesome. And to, to recognize this, because I changed that mindset, because I had that popping moment. And along the way, I've had a few other of those say pop moments where people had said to me, this can't be done. And I'm, what do you mean I'm doing? I'm in the middle of doing it. You're a first generation American who barely graduated high school. You can't do anything. No one's going to listen to you. There's not a bookstore in the world you can't walk into today. Not one in the world that doesn't have my quotes in it. Books with my words in it that aren't written by me. Books that aren't mine. Everything that people said is impossible. Why? Because I took action. One of the things that are, that are missing, that are missing in so many careers, I don't care how successful anyone is who's in this group, whether you're just starting or you're, you're super successful, I get clients who are both. Nothing happens, as Einstein said, nothing happens until something moves, but you have to adjust. You have to make those adjustments. You have to decide what you want, create the path, create the map, and get your ass out there. The reality of it is most people won't do that. And you've heard that expressed in so many different ways and quotes and, and, and thoughts of people who won't do that, people who turn away as soon as it gets difficult, people who have a sense of entitlement. The reality of it is we have this opportunity, this moment, this pandemic moment, wherever you are in the world, whether you're somewhere that's super strict, like, like where I am in New York City, or somewhere that's even stricter in Paris, you have an opportunity to make an adjustment, to, to adjust, repackage, rebrand, whatever you have to do. We're, we're, we're looking at it now. We're looking at a rebranding and a repackaging of an event because its leader and her team made the adjustment. Let's not lose that message there and then focus it on your own life and, and, and where in your life do you have the opportunity to do the same? Whether you're going to continue to wait for something, you ever notice you ever notice I, I found something when I was young and, and I, the reason I went in through behavioral sciences because it always seems so clear to me. But when I was young, I, I noticed something interesting. So, so my parents are Italian and Chilean. Two things are true when you have Italian and Chilean parents. Number one, I have to literally hold this thing so that I don't move while I talk. I have to hold this thing. You talk while you move. If I'm on a stage, I'm pacing back and forth. It's crazy. I can't help it. That's what I am. And number two, you're raised Catholic. <laughs> like you're, you're raised in full ideos meal, Catholic. There's a rosary. There's a crazy grandma. It all comes with it. It all comes with it. There's, there's, a, there's your mom secretly like spraying holy water on you as you're a teenager. There's all of that. And so, but I always noticed we would go through to church every Sunday, like good Catholics. We'd go to church every Sunday where my parents would try not to beat us, me and my brother up as we didn't behave during church. But I always remembered that you would have this priest up there and he would be telling people, hey, listen, when, if you're going through financial troubles, if you need monetary help, if you need this, when life brings you to your knees, pray, right? And when you do, the windows of abundance shall be opened unto ye. Oh, that's great. But then later they hand out a basket. I said, wait a second. How come you're telling me that if we need money, if we need something different, just talk to the sky. But you know, when you need money, you better hand out that basket. Wait a second. What happened to the windows of abundance opening unto ye? I paid attention to this and I remember asking my um, we didn't have Sunday school. It was called CCD. It was like that. It was the Catholic version of Sunday school. And I remember asking the, the nun back then there was nuns, right? It wasn't, there wasn't so uh, uh, women, uh, women's movement wasn't socially accept as socially acceptable back then. So there were more nuns. And so it was a nun and 
I remember saying to her about that. And she said, as they did, open and honest, ready for conversation. She said, go say 10 our fathers. Oh man, I shouldn't have asked. I shouldn't have said anything. But I did notice that this was what it was. And as I went through and as I read and I, I, as I was going through my military time, but I went through some scary times. And when you do, you kind of collapse inward and you do look for those outside sources. And I started paying attention and I started listening to, to the greats of the self-help as well. And I was seeing the, the greats, uh, RIP Wayne Dyers of the world, right? Where they would say, listen, focus on something and put your energy on it. And the universe conspires in your favor. All you have to do is have the intention and then it comes. But then that guy went on a 20 city tour. Wait a second. How come you're telling me I just have to think, but you're working your ass off. Why aren't you telling people you're working your ass off? And as I started going through the industries, if I started going through my goal coming from poverty, being a first generation American, I mentioned our attic apartment. My goal coming through was going to say, I want to be sitting in the boardrooms with the millionaires. I want to be sitting in the boardroom. Billionaires didn't really exist when I was starting this in the early 90s. So I want to sit in there with the millionaires. I want to sit in there with the billionaires. And, and so I worked my way to that point, to that consultation point. And there I was. I was sitting there with the millionaires, sitting there with the billionaires as we had conversations. And I realized at that moment that neither millionaires nor billionaires ask you for advice on money. They instead want to talk to you about their families, their behavior, their habits, their addictions. And I was like, shit, I should have gone for psychology, not business. And so I make these adjustments, but again, you keep having to shift. So during these times, during these times, what is it that you can shift in your life? Where is it that you can go instead of holding on to that victim mentality, instead of holding on to, oh, poor me, everything changed. When everything changes, change. It's not easy. Life is simple. If you haven't noticed it yet, life is simple. It's just not easy. You want to lose weight? You want to look healthier? Easy. Watch what you eat and exercise. Simple. Why, why all the books? Why the whole section in the, in the bookstore? You want to be healthier? Watch what you eat and exercise. Simple. <laughs> because we know it's not easy. <laughs> life is simple. It's just not easy. We know these things. Oh, you're in an abusive relationship? Leave. Ta-da. Simple, but not easy. So we have to recognize that when we make these adjustments in our life, that it is simple, but we have to create the map. We have to create the map. And in this, I have four pillars. In 20 plus years of dealing with the who's who and the what's what, I've, I've established four pillars of these successes. The four pillars are intent, vision, action, and clarity. Intent, vision, action, and clarity. Intent. What is intent? Intent is what do you want? We have become masters of talking about what we don't want. We have become masters of complaining. Of sick, of being sick of something. Well, what do you want? Uh, Steve, I'm sick of living paycheck to paycheck. You didn't tell me anything. What do you want? I want to make more money. No, specifically, if you got a $10 raise, you succeeded in that, in that sense. You want to make more? You just gain $10. Ta-da. You happy? No. So let's be specific. What do you want? If this was a map, this would be the destination, a specific destination. It's intent. Why does that matter? It matters because for all the cognitive sciences, that exist, and for the advances in cognitive science that exist, you'll notice that in academia, the, the cognitive scientists are still arguing about what consciousness is. So for all the advances we make, we have really only picked up a grain or two of sand on, on a multi-mile long beach. The argument about what consciousness even is, and the fMRI machine threw endless complexity into that, because with becoming more and more clear that that our consciousness is us just being told the direction we're already headed in. So why is that important? Because there's this idea that's called the egocentric paradigm. What that means is that 
100% of your life is happening in your head. So that means my buddy Val, Val is a story you're telling yourself. Steve is a story I'm telling myself. Susan is a story you're telling yourself. John is a story you're telling yourself. And I wake up, Steve, you wake up Val, Susie, and John every day. They call it the persistence of self. They're not sure why. Why you wake up that way and you continue that story. But you do continue that story every day. Unless you have a little brain issue, a, a, a sickness, you bump your head, you have some degradation. We know Alzheimer's, that kind of stuff. You start losing part of that story. Some of those bridges and tunnels start collapsing. But without, other than that, you just continue your story every day. And 100% of your life happens in your head. Is it cold out? Is it warm out? I think it's nice you think it's cold. We're both right. How is that movie? How is that book? How did this taste? Is that an aggressive act or not aggressive act? Is that a big deal or not a big deal? Completely <laughs> differing opinions happening. You know what the coolest thing? Aside from recognition of that, that egocentric paradigm, that means the story you're telling yourself is everything. Your agreement with reality defines your life, 100%. If you look back at old theology, regardless of the religion, old philosophy, regardless of where in the world from, they're all telling you that your agreement with reality defines your life. The story you're telling yourself becomes your reality. So much so that now we know eyes don't see, right? Eyes collect data. And your brain tells you what you see based on what? Your agreement with reality. That's why when your friend is dating somebody nobody can stand but them, you're like, how do you not see that they're doing that? How do you not see this? Everyone else sees that because it's all you see. It's called the confirmation bias. And then when that relationship goes sour and, a re and an agreement with reality changes, what do they say? I don't know what I ever saw in that. We start recognizing when you decide to buy a new car, hey, I'm looking at that blue Nissan. Suddenly, what's, what's on the road tomorrow? Endless blue Nissans. Ta-da! Is it because there's more Nissans today than there was before you thought of it? No. And confirmation bias. Your brain allowed you to see that. Your agreement with reality defines your life. You want to see something really cool? You all can hear me real time, right? So if you close one eye, close your right eye. Keep your left eye open. You see the side of your nose, right? Awesome. Keep both eyes open. Now close your left eye and leave your right eye open. Now you see the other side of your nose, right? Awesome. Open both eyes again. Where'd your nose go? Through evolution, your brain and agreement with reality has decided that you only need to see the side of your nose when one eye is closed because you need that for depth perception, per periphery, and, and travels. When both are open, it's recognized that you don't need to see it, so it deletes it. Your agreement with reality defines your life. That's great news. The bad news is, what else is it deleting in your life? When you say, there's no opportunities, and guess what? Ta-da, no opportunities. There's no good people out there. Guess what? Ta-da, no good people. Your brain is so powerful. The story you tell yourself is so powerful. That let's say I have to go in for, you have to go in for knee surgery. Let's pick something horrific, knee surgery. So you go in for knee surgery. What do they do? They put you in the bed. They get you ready. You got your leg exposed, your knee exposed. And guess what? It's all ready to be done. They're going to open up your leg, take out your knee, put in a new knee, close your leg. That sounds really painful. But when they're doing that, do they rub anesthesia on your on your leg do they numb your leg at all no they give it a shot to make sure it's numb no nothing they put a little mask over your face and they say okay you're gonna count down from 30 you'll never make it to 20 but they tell you you're gonna count down from 30 and without touching any of the nerve endings without touching your leg at all without numbing it at all they turn off steve they turn off suits the rest of you is still, you're still breathing. You're still doing everything else. They turn off the person who would receive the pain. That's how badass it is to be important to the story you're telling yourself and who you are in your mind.
that when they're going to open up your leg, take out a part, put in a new part and close your leg, they don't have to numb your leg. They just have to turn off the person who would be receiving the pain. Your agreement with reality defines your life. And we've all had smaller versions of that when we were kids, right? You fall and scrape your knee. You don't realize it. You keep playing and you have a little itch on your knee and you scratch it and you realize you're bloody. And then you look down, you notice your cut. And what ends up happening instantly? Ouch. It didn't hurt until it entered your reality. That's when it started hurting. So that's why intent is so important. The first pillar is so important. Intention is everything. What do you want? Most people, because they don't know what they specifically want, because they tend to be running from things, because they're saying, I'm sick of living paycheck to paycheck, that doesn't mean anything. I'm sick of dealing with this shit. doesn't mean anything. What do you want? Because when you don't know where you're going, every road takes you there. So you can confuse motion with progress. You can keep, Steve, I do this, I do this, I do this, and nothing keeps happening. Awesome. But what are you looking to happen? I don't know. Something different. Well, good luck then. You're, sh you're driving to you don't know where, and then you're saying, I don't know where I am. Well, you're successful. What do you want? Intent. Next one is vision. Vision matters because, again, visualization is what your body's doing anyway. Visualization is something that we are all doing anyway, all day. That's why you hear peak Olympians, world champions, top people at the top of their game. They visualize everything before they do it. They visualize what it smells like, what the track smells like, what the pool smells like, what the boxing gloves smell like, what the cage smells like, whatever it is. They visualize it to that degree. And they'll, you'll often hear it afterwards. They win their, hey, here's your congratulations on this gold medal again. I said, I ran this race in my mind a thousand times, 10,000 times. You're all just seeing it for the first time. Visualization matters. It, it's how it becomes real to you. And when you're mindful of what you visualize, you realize how much nonsense you visualize. I used to do a, a talk in my lectures where I'd say, hey, um, picture your dream house, your dream car, your dream, you know, dream, whatever, boat, whatever it is. And I'd wait for people to be done picturing it, visualizing. It. I'd say, visualize it. And I'd bring them through this whole process, make sure that they really visualize it. Then I'd ask a simple question. How many of you are in this visualization? How many of you are in the picture? Almost nobody. Some people, usually about 30%, visualize someone else in the picture. We we're so conditioned to buying frames with other families in it that we start visualizing and seeing what we see in commercials. Other people living our dream. So when you pay attention to what you visualize, recognizing that your agreement with reality defines your life and that you have to recognize that it's even real to you, we have to make sure that we're doing that. So the first two pillars, intent and vision. What do you want? Do you see it? Is it possible for you? Have you initiated those bridges and tunnels your brain is going to require for you to get there? Because again, remember, the reason we're habitual creatures, the reason we have habits, the reason we have patterns, the reason we have addictions, all the, all the different words wearing different clothes that just mean cyclical. We're patternists. Our brain is designed for efficiency. It does not want to work hard. That is why habits are difficult to break. Because your brain's success comes on how little it works. It wants you to be able to drive home from work and not remember how you got there. That's successful. It wants you to go, oh, wow, it's Friday. Oh, wow, it's 2020. Oh, wow, 2025. Oh, wow. It wants you to do that. It is successful when you do that. That's why when you say, oh, that's it, I've eaten too much, this, this quarantine turned into a quarantine, and I need to get this done, I need to get this out, right? When you start doing that, your brain's like, come on, man, we'll start Monday. Why are we going today? We recorded, there's a new survivor. We recorded that. I think there's going to be something happening. You just got the Sarah Lee pound cake. Side note, Sarah Lee pound cake. How is that even legal to sell? That's it. That's like when they came out with the bigger Cheez-Its. How dare you come out? What an act of aggression. A bigger box of Cheez-Its, I, what I look at like as a challenge, I look at the big box of Cheez-Its, I'm like, challenge accepted, stop and shop. 
And so your brain doesn't want to do the work required to create a new habit. That's why it talks you out of it. It's not that you don't have willpower, all the nonsense people who didn't know what they're talking about have been saying for years. It's that you have a healthy brain. That's the good news. The bad news is you have a healthy brain. It's going to make you work for that construction, the new patterns. And so intent and vision is huge because we want to know where we're going and visualize. We want to start that construction for our brain to be ready for the work we're going to put it through. Next pillar is action. Action is two parts to it. One, a blueprint, a map. Intent and vision, no one can see it. It's just happening in your head. I, you can, I can't see it. The first part of action is create that map. Create that list. The point is to take it out of the ether and put it on paper, put it on a computer, something, someone to take it into, bring it into our three-dimensional world. And the second part of action is then unass the couch and move. Follow that plan, follow that map. Nobody has, I don't, I see people at different ages here. I'm 45. Haven't you noticed that absolutely nobody cares about what your obstacles or barriers are or what your excuses are? Haven't you noticed that yet? Haven't you noticed no one's coming in to swoop and save you yet? Nobody. You have to decide what you want. Make sure it's real. Start priming your brain for the actions you're about to take, then put it on paper and go move. That's when you shut up. One of the things that we have to be, care be careful with, and it's weird when you have a professional speaker and other professional voice people, the most important thing you can do when going towards success, towards your goals and dreams is shut up. Let your action speak. If you have to tell people what's important to you, you're lying to yourself and them. If you spent uh, just a few work hours with me, you would know I wouldn't have to say anything. You know who I am, what I'm about, and you have this slight suspicion that I'll run your ass over if you get in the way. Let your behavior speak when it comes to your success, not only in your professional life, but in your personal life. What does it look like in your personal life? What does I love you look like? Shut up. We're all professional speakers and probably some great writers in here. We know we can write. We'll melt you with some words. But what does it look like? What does I'm proud of you look like? What does I'm sorry look like? What does I, I, I want to be better look like? What does I want to be supportive look like? That's in relationships. Apply that to your business. What does I want to be healthier look like? We all know what it sounds like. But what does it look like? If people have to ask you, you're lying. If you have to, I really want to be, why do you have to tell me? You don't have to tell me that. The people I know who are successful don't have to tell you anything. You see it every single day. And you've probably said it to your kids. Mom, I want to do better in school. Dad, I want to do better in school. And you'll say what? When you do, you will. You don't have to tell me that. Apply that to ourselves. Let's apply that to ourselves. Eliminate any woo-woo idea that just thinking it's going to make it happen. The application, intent, what do you want? The vision, is it real? Let me prime my brain for this. Action, let me put it on blueprint. Let me move towards it. And the last pillar is clarity. Maintain that clarity, maintain that focus. Why? Well, having the blueprint, having the blueprint gives you the clarity. The good news is we use this all the time. These four pillars of success, you use them all the time. You use them when you go to the grocery store. If you're going to go to the grocery store, you don't just say in your head, I need groceries. No, you have your, if you want to be successful, you have 
I need milk. I need eggs. I need diapers. I need whatever you need. You're specific, right? And you visualize it's real to you. You can go. It's real to you. Then you take action. First thing's a list, right? You know what happens when you don't go with the list. We all know what happens when you don't go with the list. And what happens then? You decide I need milk, egg, sugar. I need pancake, whatever I need. And then you visualize it. And then what do you do? You vision board? You pray and meditate? No, you get in your car and you go. How come just wanting eggs and wanting soda and wanting bread doesn't just attract it all to you? Because it doesn't. It doesn't work that way anywhere, ever. You have to write it down. If you want to be successful, have that list. Then you go. And how do you maintain clarity when you're at the supermarket? You look at your list. Ta-da! We all use this to go to the supermarket. We don't use it for our life goals and dreams. That's crazy. If I said, come, I'm, I'm in Port Washington, New York, Long Island. Come to my house for a barbecue. Would you say, oh, sure. Long Island's a 10-hour drive, four-hour drive, six-hour drive, two-day drive, whatever. You'd say, sure, I'll just drive for that long and I'll get there, right? <laughs> no. You'll want a specific thing, a specific intention. The visualization's real. It's real to you that you'll get there, but the specific intention will help you understand how real it is for you to get there. And then you'll map it out, right? You'll put it in your GPS. Maybe you'll go old school map quest, whatever it is, you'll map it out. You'll know the two things, where you are and where you're going, right? And then what? We pray, meditate, and wait for my barbecue to come to you? No. You get in your car and you go. And along the way, what keeps you fight with, from fighting with the person sitting next to you, like my parents did whenever we went somewhere? You have the clarity because you either have something talking to you, make a, you know, in, in 20 miles, get off, exit, whatever. If you're my older brother, for some reason, he's like 50, but Yoda talks to him on his thing. And so, but someone's talking to you. If you're a regular map, if you're looking at a paper, old school, either way, you can enjoy the journey because you're following me. I'm taking this step, this step, this step, this step, and I will arrive. We've all used that to go to a barbecue, to go to a party, to go to the grocery store. We've all used it. And yet we don't use it for the really important things in our lives. Instead, we don't know where we're going. And we just assume by being busy, something will change. It won't. Your brain is designed to make you feel like you're on that, like you're on a rocking chair. You're always moving, but you're not going anywhere. How you change motion to progress is by having intent, vision, taking action, and maintaining clarity. We use it when we do construction. The landowners don't say, hey, let's put something here. No, let's build a, a, a store. Okay, cool. Let's visualize it. They have to visualize it so clearly with, a, with a engineers and architects that they have to all create this visualization. And when they take action, the first part of it is, is a literal blueprint so that you can see. And again, after that blueprint, what do they do? They take action. <laughs> Nothing happens until that first shovel hits, until anything, right? And then they start. And how do they maintain clarity? If it's raining, if it's windy, right? The road to success is always under construction. If it's raining, if it's windy, if there's something going on, what do we do? They wait. We're on step number 27. If we can't get to step 28, why are we yelling at each other? There's no reason to yell at each other. There's no way to do anything. We just keep going. And when we get to step 6,000, whatever step it is, ta-da, there's a store. No one's surprised. Wow, look, we all got together. <laughs> we put blueprints and construction, and here it is, ta-da. No one's surprised because that's how you gain success in our world. What we do on the other side, that's you. everyone can argue that. It's tough enough for me on this side. So what is it that we do? We know that that's the formula to make it work here. So how are you applying that in your life? And how are you maintaining that clarity in your life? It's simple to ignore. It's simple to ignore because we think we have a plan until you have to show that plan to someone else and then you have to show the people the progress to your plan and you can't, then you don't have a plan. You don't have a goal, you have a wish. Those are two different things. 
They are two different things. So as you go through this, as you go through this transition in your career, as you go through this transition in your rebranding, you're, you're, you're in voiceover. I don't have to, I'm not in your field, business in general. I don't have to tell you how many more people went into your field when this happened. I don't have to tell you how much busier it just got for all of you. So what are you going to do to adjust, to reposition, to rebrand, to remarket, to whatever, to, to what Val's doing, to create a cohesive group? What is it that you're doing to adjust? You won't be the first, but they're brilliant people who went away. Blockbuster used to exist. Try to explain that to a 17-year-old. Oh, you want to see a movie? Oh, you want to see a movie? When I was your age, I went into this big building where it was just filled with movies. And I had a hope that not too many people wanted to see the movie I want to see because then there was no more movies left. And they'd say, huh? What do you mean there's no more movies? Like the movies are gone? What do you mean? There's no more movies left. You have to wait because... Too many people are watching that movie. That doesn't even make sense to them. Just like when I make the outdated phrase of, hey, put in a movie. What is that even? Put it in where? What are you talking about? Put what in what? That's all. Put in a movie is already outdated. It's like when I, when I bust my friend's chops when they're like, oh, I'm going to tape that. Are you going to tape that 1986? Is that what you're doing? That's not a thing. But. That's how fast this moved. And did you know that Netflix approached Blockbuster first? Netflix was a startup and they had money to get it so far. They did back what startups used to do. where They just get it up, just get it up so that it's tip, on its tippy toes and then they sell it to someone who has money. And that's what they did. They said they had the, the, all, the whole Netflix as we know it. And they were just starting up and they said, Blockbuster, we want to hand this to you. Take all your movies, they would be digitized. This computer era is coming, all this stuff's coming. And Blockbuster, much like my dad, who still has a flip phone, didn't believe in the adjustment of media. And they said, No, thanks. We really think that people love the experience of coming into our building and taking a movie and being charged $800 for it when you forget to bring it back. They really like that. And they were wrong. They didn't adjust. They didn't adjust and Blockbuster is gone. Not only gone, but like you can't tell it to a teenager, I promise you. They have no idea what you're talking about. It sounds crazy to them that that, that was even a way of doing it. Look at bookstores. A lot of our bookstores, the government keeps them afloat. Bookstores. Because digital is so powerful. And again, it's about adjustments. Kodak invented the digital camera. Where's Kodak? They didn't adjust. People like film. They like our films. They like to process and touch it. They like to hold it. Do they? Buy Kodak. They like the videos? They do? Buy Blockbuster. People like to hold the book. Buy Borders, buy Walden, buy everyone huge. And if you go into a Barnes and Noble now, the least thing they have in there is books. You could buy every action figure, puzzle, art, song, any, anything. And they have about 12 books, three from psychics and some sort of politic one. Like it's really, it's really where we've gone to this adjustment. And again, in your life, make these adjustments. I can't stress this enough, make these adjustments. And so look at, look at the way that you've been doing, what's been working for you, what's not working for you, how you can make these adjustments and take action on them. Whether it's a repackaging for convenience, whether it's a repackaging for price, whether it's a repackaging for what you're able to offer and how much of it you're able to offer, whatever that may mean in your industry, make those adjustments. Don't think don't the, blockbuster wasn't safe they were the only ones there don't think you're safe because you're good 
People don't want good. They want convenient. They will walk into a Walmart any day other than the mom and pop store. Any day, knowing that the third time they wash that shirt, it's going to look like it's going to look like have holes in it. They're still going to do it. They want good. They want convenience. They want all in one. We know this about the consumer. So when we are engaging with those consumers, when we are offering a product to those consumers, let's not get lost in our own ego. Let's not get lost in our, in our uh, brain's desire to not change. It is, you know, social business Darwinism, right? It's not the strongest. It's those that adjust. It's those that adjust. And so recognizing that we're going to adjust, recognizing that we're, that we have the opportunity to excel from this, that we have the opportunity to move forward from this. I, I did it. I basically, my career was traveling and talking to large groups. What, what got its ass kicked more than that in these past several months, <laughs> traveling and talking to large groups. So I had to adjust. Fortunately, we were able to adjust in our schools and the stuff that we are building more philanthropic stuff. Um, but having to make these adjustments, this is the only this I'm doing. I did it because I, I, uh, I, Val, I can't tell you enough how rare someone like Val is. And, uh, and I told her I'll do anything for you. I would, I wouldn't do this normally for anyone else. And so recognizing that we have this opportunity to adjust, recognizing that this is the beginning of something. Don't say the new normal. Nobody liked normal. You're miserable and fucking normal. So let's not go back to normal, but let's uh, make these adjustments and find yourself on the, on the other side of this more ready than ever, personally and professionally. It's the greatest way to do it, to have that popping moment, to do it, it, again, life is simple. It's just not easy. It requires that that courage, not, not not bravery so much, but but the it requires that courage to to move on. Can I? Do I have a, a, another minute for a quick for a quick military story? And bravery and courage. Are we good with that? All right, cool. I can't yeah. hear you guys, so thumbs up is good. All right. Now this one's a little rough around the edges. Because I am as well. And the military is a really, it's an interesting place because when you're going through it, it's not as funny as 20 plus years later. One particular story where I was taught the difference between bravery and courage. And, and, and why I'm telling you this is because it does take bravery to endeavor for more. It does take bravery to come out of your comfort zone because all of us have been alive long enough to know that it, nothing is un, as unpopular as positive change amongst friends and family. We know this. We know the first line of resistance is going to be the people who love you the most. So it takes bravery to say, I'm going to set up in this new endeavor. I'm going to follow my goals. I'm going to follow my dreams. I'm going to make a change. I know you've all known me for this many years. I'm going to make a change. You will inspire them 100%, but only after them trying their hardest to get you to stop. That's just how that works. So it requires bravery to endeavor for more. We had, we had just, how do I? We had just come back from a grueling military event and I'm a kid I'm 21 maybe and I was fortunate enough to be given a, a medal and it's a it's a weird thing to get a medal in front of your peers who were there with you especially since it's so much teamwork it was weird to get singled out for achievement when everyone went through the same shitty thing. And I think that the, the master sergeant saw that I was having problem with that, where again, I was, I was a kid, I was 21. And he said, uh, so gracefully, this guy, 
you know, perspective's everything, right? So this guy, how I remember him right now, he's like 400 years old. Like he, to, how I remember him, he's so old and he talked like this because he smoked like 20 cigarettes at a time. Like, oh, you always saw him smoking and he was always like this. And how I remember him, he's like a thousand years old. But just by math, in this story, he has to actually be younger than I am right now. Isn't that crazy how perspectives like that? So he sees me having trouble about to be awarded this medal. And he takes that moment to so gracefully and elegantly say, Maraboli, you got a problem with this? And I said, uh, no, sir, I just it's kind of weird to get an award in front of everybody. We were all there together. We, it's, it's, a, it's a, a brave thing for all of us. He said, Maraboli, do you think you're getting this award because you were brave? Everybody out there is brave. You are getting this award because you were courageous. Do you not know the difference between bravery and courage? He obviously saw the look on my face and I, and I didn't. He said, Maraboli, I'm going to explain this to you once and I want you to never forget it. Any brave man will grab a lion by his balls. But it takes courage to keep squeezing. <laughs> and so I will never forget that because as we endeavor through life, as we endeavor through our businesses, as we endeavor through our personal relationships, as we endeavor as parents, as friends, as siblings, as, 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 as children, as we go through life, there are endless opportunities to quit. There is endless resistance. It is bravery to do so many things, to embark. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to be in healthier relationships. I'm going to put a stop to this abuse. I'm going to start making more money. Whatever it is, that's bravery and good for you. Badass, good for you. But somewhere in that point, you are going to have to keep squeezing. Somewhere in here, Val, I can't hear you, but I feel you. Somewhere in this process, you had to, the, the, there was a hundred options to quit. You had to keep squeezing and you did. And that's why this happened. What a talk to give first thing in the morning, huh? Jeez. I have no, they, no, I gave, I was, I was, invited to because it, it's an interesting thing when you do get successful there's a there's a uh, um, a joke about the, a catholic this woman she calls the priest right and he's like hello she calls on the phone she says father father our dog died our dog died and we want to give our dog a a a funeral we want to have a whole mass and a funeral for our dog because this dog meant everything to us and the father says, I'm so sorry, my child. We love you. I'm so sorry for your, pay, for your loss. But this is the Catholic Church. We don't do things for animals. We only do it for people. We're so sorry you're in our prayers. I personally will add you. Love your whole family. So sorry. But, but we can't do that. She said, but you don't understand. This was like our child. We had this dog from the second it was born. We raised it, everything. It helped with our kids, everything. It, it's like a child we lost this dog. And they, he said, I know, and I'm so sorry, but, but maybe we just can't. With the Catholic Church, we can't do that. Maybe you can find the local, uh, the local pet shelter or something. And they said, okay, okay, thank you, Father. Do you think that they would take like a big donation or something? We re it means everything for us. We want like a foundation, everything like that. And he said, sweetie, you didn't tell me your dog was Catholic. Right, so... You, you find out through success that suddenly your dog becomes Catholic. And so I was literally invited to the archdiocese, this, this like the hub of, of Catholic priests and bishops uh, in New York. And I told the bravery and courage story. I can't tell you the the most uncomfortable I've ever felt. 
I knew, you know, when I lost them, when I said grab a line, buy his ball, I should have said testicles. I should have said something else. I should have thrown in a caveat. Hey, testicles, because the word testament comes from that. Did you guys know that? Testament comes from that. They used to. So if you, any theology, they would say when they'd make a deal, you'd read it as in biblically, it'll say he placed his hand in his inner thigh and they agreed. What they used to do in Bronze Age Mesopotamia is men, obviously, were the only ones who were allowed to make deals. They would grab each other's testicles and make promises. You promise on future generations. That's where a testament comes from. It was promises from that. And so I should have led with that. But good old New York Steve, nah, grab a lion by his balls. I watched their faces drop instantly. And uh, it was one of those uncomfortable moments. But recognizing this in your life is tremendous. And so when you apply your intent, your vision, your action, and your clarity, you, you have fun with life some. Don't take it so seriously. Like Robert, like uh, uh, Bukowski said, hey, listen, none of us get out alive. Have fun with this. We're all, as a species, as this primate species, we are all searching for fire while holding a lit torch. We're hilarious. We're hilarious. And so let's just navigate this, trying to find ways to refine, improve, enhance our businesses, our performances, our personal lives, give ourselves the opportunity to forgive not only other people, but ourselves and recognize that it's all in your head. All of it's happening in your head, every single bit of it. We can prove it. We prove it when they take out your knee and put in a new one. All of it's happening in your head. Make it a great place and let that shine outward. Like people like Val, like the good people you know, cultivating in your circle. Most importantly, if you have to tell people what you want, what you're about and what your goals are, you're doing it wrong. Adjust, 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 write it down and then shut your mouth and move. And don't forget, keep squeezing. Folks, thank you so much for having me on today. I hope you all have an amazing day wherever you are. I appreciate it. Um, and I look forward to the next one where maybe we'll all be in person again.